Welcome to the Federal Society's webinar call. Today, December 13th, 2022, we are here to discuss the importance of the federal appellate courts, bringing them out of the Supreme Court's shadow. My name is Katie McClendon, and I am the Director of Publications at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts participating in today's event. The Federalist Society takes no positions on particular legal or public policy issues. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us Judge Thomas Griffith, Aaron Hawley, and Judge Trevor McFadden. I will give very brief introductions, and I encourage you to visit our website for more information about their many accomplishments. Judge Griffith served on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit from 2005 to 2020. Before that, he served as General Counsel of Brigham Young University, Senate Legal Counsel for the U.S. Senate, and in private practice. He's now Special Counsel at Hunt and Andrews Kerr. Ms. Hawley serves as Senior Counsel to the Appellate Team at Alliance Defending Freedom. She was previously Associate Professor of Law at the University of Missouri, where her scholarship focused on federal courts. She has also practiced appellate law in D.C. law firms and the Department of Justice. Judge McFadden was appointed to the United States District, District Court for the District of Columbia in 2017. Prior to his appointment, he served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice and was a partner at a D.C. law firm. The panelists will begin by giving some opening remarks, and then we will have some time for discussion among the panelists. After that, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window so that our speakers will have access to them when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Judge Griffith, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Katie, and thank you to the Federalist Society. Um, I, 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 I've been there from the beginning, and you can tell from the gray hair, and uh, uh, it, my association with the Federalist Society has been one of the richest sources of uh, inspiration and education that I can imagine. And it's an honor to be uh, uh, involved with anything the Federal Society does. And so thank you for the invitation. I'm also uh, pleased to be here with, uh, with my dear friend and former colleague, uh, Judge McFadden. Uh, and uh, a pleasure for me to finally uh, meet someone I've heard about uh, so fondly from so many for so long, Professor Aaron Hawley. So um, thank you for for uh, being here. So I, I'm going to uh, uh, tee it up for the for the others for what hopefully will be an interesting and robust discussion about the the role of what the Constitution refers to as the inferior courts. Right, uh, uh, the Constitution refers to the Supreme Court and such other inferior courts uh, as Congress uh, will create, and the federal courts of appeals uh, as, is part part of that uh, 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 part of that description. Um, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make four quick points in in the time that's allotted me, and then I'm gonna tee up the fifth one for, for Professor Holly just by making a little bit of reference to it. So first of all, I, we start with something that's uh, maybe obvious, but uh, ought to be uh, stated again and again in terms of the importance of the the federal uh, courts of appeals. Yeah, given the Supreme Court's limited docket uh, and, and the fact that they have so much discretion over what they uh, hear and 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 don't hear. Uh, it's it's the rare case that that gets to the Supreme Court. The more typical case uh, in in the federal courts uh, ends up in the Court of Appeals, and it ends there. And so the federal courts of appeals uh, are uh, serve as the final word in the vast majority of, of of federal cases that are filed. And so for that reason alone, uh, we ought to pay attention to how they function. Uh, how they're different than the district court that Judge McFadden sits on honorably, uh, how they're different than the Supreme Court. Um, but let me start with some statistics that to give you a little bit of an overview of what, what uh, typically happens on a, a federal court's appeals. These statistics are from uh, uh, the, the year 2021. Uh, there were 46,000 filings in federal courts of appeals uh, uh, during uh, that year, 23,000 of which were civil, um, 10,000 of which were criminal. Uh, and of the criminal uh, cases, about 80% of those uh, were involved in the following offenses, drugs, uh, firearms and explosives, uh, uh, property damage, in, in, including uh, uh, fraud, injury to property, including fraud uh, and, and, and sex offenses. Uh, 7,000 of those 46,000 filings were 
uh, uh, challenging actions of administrative agencies. And in, in most of the uh, federal circuits, those are immigration cases. 85% uh, of the administrative actions filed uh, in the federal courts of appeals are involve uh, uh, immigration determination, I'm sorry, immigration uh, decisions. The outlier from that is the court I had the pleasure of sitting on, uh, the DC circuit. We hear almost no immigration cases, and yet over 60% of our docket is challenges to actions taken by the uh, federal agencies. Finally, there are 4,000 uh, actions that are called original uh, proceedings. Uh, those are mostly habeas challenges to by, brought by prisoners. And then there's a category called miscellaneous, and those are class actions. But anyway, it gives you sort of the, 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 the lay of the land. Um, uh, given, given the importance of the federal courts of, of appeals, uh, many political scientists have noticed uh, and uh, ge general observers have noticed that there's been a real uh, change in the last couple of decades in terms of the uh, uh, nomination and confirmation process. Much more time and political capital is spent uh, by presidents and by the Senate uh, in the selection of uh, federal, uh, federal appeals court judges. One can debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, as someone who survived, I guess I could say it's a good thing. Uh, uh, I have some bruises from it, so maybe I could say it's a bad thing. Uh, but, uh, but it is a topic of great uh, interest and concern um, throughout the nation and in, in the judiciary. Uh, because folks have noticed these have become highly partisan uh, uh, battles. Uh, and maybe that's something that we can talk about uh, when we get to the question and answer is what, if any, impact that has on, on, on the federal uh, uh, courts of appeals. Uh, 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 next to last thing I'll mention is the dynamics of decision-making on the federal courts of appeals are quite different uh, than at the Supreme Court and in, uh, and in the district court. Uh, the, the district court uh, is uh, uh, limited by uh, precedent of the circuit and of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, the district court judge uh, can safely assume that her opinion uh, is going to be reviewed uh, li likely to be reviewed by uh, the Court of Appeals. And that's a significant limitation on, 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 on her approach to the case. Court of Appeals, that's not the case. Uh, it's the rare case by the Court of Appeals that's going to make it to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, 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 decisions by Court of Appeals can be reviewed by the entire Court of Appeals. The decision of the three-judge panel can be reviewed by the entire Court of Appeals. But it, it varies widely among the circuits as to whether that's likely to happen. The court that I sat on, the D.C. Circuit, uh, uh, N-Bank review of a Court of Appeals decision was, was, was quite, quite rare. Um, but on a Court of Appeals, the other factor that you have, which is, which is different than the district courts, is that you have to get two other people to, to agree with you. And, and in most of the Courts of Appeals, the ethic is strongly in favor of unanimous decisions. Uh, and so frequently you will find judges... Um, uh, coming up with a narrower decision to be able to get a, uh, a majority. Anyway, these are some of the dynamics that that that, that work on the Court of Appeals that are a little bit different uh, than than the other federal courts. Uh, the the last point that that I'll that I'll mention and I'll hand it over to Professor Hawley to, to to tease this out is that the Court of Appeals, the federal courts of appeals, serve as a as a testing ground for uh, for arguments that litigants hope uh, to get before. Uh, the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court uses the Court of Appeals as a place to test out arguments uh, frequently before they have a chance uh, to, to take, to take a, a crack at them. So with that, what we call the percolating function of the Court of Appeals, I'll uh, end my remarks and pass them over to Professor Holland. Uh, thank you so much, Judge Griffith. Uh, thank you, Judge McFadden, um, and to the Federal Society for having us uh, today. Um, and, and absolutely, um, I am sort of the um, non-experienced uh, uh, on the on this panel uh, about federal judges. Um, but from that perspective, I, I can also be, I think, more laudatory uh, in the sense of I think the uh, explanation of today's panel noted that 55,000 cases uh, are decided by the federal courts of appeals uh, every single year as compared to about 55 or, or perhaps 60 in a good year. 
by the United States Supreme Court. So as Judge Griffith ably put it, uh, the federal courts of appeals are really of primary importance in setting uh, the arc of the law uh, for uh, the country as a whole. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at Rule 10 uh, of the United States um, Supreme Court rules, that's the rule that governs the cert procedure. And that rule lays out two bases for getting a court uh, to review the case, for getting the Supreme Court to review a case. Uh, the first of those is by far the most important. It's where a conflict exists um, among the lower federal courts um, or among the lower state courts of last resort. Um, and if you are serving as a law clerk uh, at the United States Supreme Court, you're really excited if you get a petition that alleges a four or five circuit split or, or something along those lines. Uh, then you can use words such as, you know, deep and abiding circuit split. Uh, and you know that you might actually have a petition before you that the Supreme Court might actually take. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have a very important issue, um, I can recall one uh, from a few years ago that involved a little device known as the BlackBerry. Um, now, many uh, of you on the call may not be aware uh, of the BlackBerry. It was sort of the precursor to the iPhone. Um, and as, as a young associate at a law firm, we were all just enthralled by the BlackBerry. It, it, you could do email, you could do uh, sort of the precursors to text, um, all of these things. Uh, it became less enthralling when the little red light buzzed, you know, at two in the morning. Um, but, but nevertheless, uh, the BlackBerry was sort of the standard fare uh, for legal firms as well as consulting firms. And yet BlackBerry ran into a, a very significant uh, patent dispute um, and in fact was found to have infringed a patent. Uh, RIM that provided the technology actually infringed the patent. Um, but the long story short, um, after several go rounds at the uh, federal circuit, uh, the upshot was that uh, BlackBerry uh, had about a billion dollar case um, appeal to the Supreme Court, even though there were significant questions about claim construction and sort of patent issues that I know nothing about. Um, and even though it involved a billion dollars, uh, the Supreme Court denied review. Um, and that's just one example of a case in which many uh, observers would call it important issues, both of law as well as practical consequences. And yet the lower federal court's decision uh, controlled as it does in some 55,000 or approximately 55,000 other cases uh, every year. So in addition to being the final word, uh, another huge benefit uh, of the lower federal courts of appeals is just getting the benefit of these minds uh, weighing in on the most impressive or most important, I should say, legal issues uh, of the day. As Judge Griffith said, this is known as percolation, and it's because you have um, 11 numbered circuits, the DC circuit uh, and the federal circuit that may confront the same legal issues and they may come out different ways. Uh, if you think of a case that was just argued at the Supreme Court 303 creative, uh, you look through the circuits and different circuits have had the question of when speech, um, you, when an artistic product uh, is speech and they've come up with different rationales uh, and different reasoning and those rationales, reasoning and cases can inform the Supreme Court's own decision making, uh, as well as lawyers litigating cases. So it, uh, again, to sort of sort of emphasize this, if you've got a, a deep circuit split, one of the reasons the Supreme Court is interested in taking those cases is because lower federal court judges and federal court of appeals judges have had the opportunity to sort of put their minds to work uh, on this legal question, and the justices will have the benefit uh, of that uh, sort of analysis. Um, uh, just two more quick points. Uh, one thing um, we have seen uh, really uh, in the recent times, but, but dating back even till the early 2000s, uh, circuit court judges who are committed to textualism and originalism pointing out places in which they might disagree with either circuit precedent or even Supreme Court precedent. Um, they do this in a respectful way. Uh, it's usually in a dissent or a concurrence, um, but uh, these concurrences can point out um, places uh, in which federal court of appeals judges um, or, or in turn federal district judges uh, think uh, the law of the circuit or the Supreme Court might have gotten it wrong. Um, one obvious example of this uh, is in the abortion context. If we look back all the way to 2004, 
Judge Edith Jones had a concurrence um, in which she pointed out that Roe and Casey were not grounded in tax structure or history. Um, fast forward, uh, you know, 20 years, almost 20 years, um, Judge Ho is writing that in his concurrence uh, in the case that came, became Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Uh, in a similar case out of Tennessee, Judge Thapar is writing a 35 page partial dissent uh, in which he's laying out sort of the historical reasons uh, that Roe and Casey were wrongly decided. Um, and you can see this in a number of areas uh, beyond abortion as well, a, a case where, um, again, some of the brightest legal minds in the country are, are having a, a chance to weigh in, even though they're bound uh, by Supreme Court precedent, still able to sort of uh, present uh, an alternative theory. Um, and then, of course, uh, I, I couldn't uh, uh, miss uh, noting the point um, that Judge Reinhardt uh, had made time and again, um, as I think he spoke of this at Yale and, and other places, um, but, but he mentioned um, that, you know, the, he, the question uh, from a Yale law student was, well, you know, aren't you frustrated uh, with the Supreme Court that they reverse you all of the time? Um, Judge Reinhardt was, was sort of notoriously uh, uh, firm in his conviction conviction of, of sticking to his vision of the Constitution rather than one perhaps propounded by the Supreme Court. Um, and Judge Reinhardt said, well, they can't catch them all. <laughs> um, and, and that may be a, a, a view of judging that, that I don't think our, our panelists here would subscribe to. Uh, but there certainly is uh, the reality, uh, again, as pointed out by Judge Griffith, that most of the cases, these important disputes that involve real legal questions and real parties are decided uh, by the courts of appeals. Well, um, I, I just want to echo my thanks to the Federal Society and my real privilege in being with two longtime friends, um, Judge Griffith and Professor Hawley. Um, Judge Griffith gave you the, the um, uh, incredibly relevant uh, perspective here of the the um, circuits uh, um, and their their role at having been a circuit judge and, and Professor Hawley really has a tremendous experience in the Supreme Court and and how the uh, courts of appeals uh, really impact and tee things up for the the Supreme Court. Uh, my 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 view is from below. Uh, as a, a, a trial judge and and uh, one of the the primary consumers and um, uh, regulated parties, if you will, um, from the the circuits, um, and I I, uh, I think Judge Reinhardt is an interesting uh, exception to what I'm going to suggest might be the the uh, by far the rule. For federal judges, and and I, in my experience, I think federal judges tend to be by nature um, conservative people. I don't mean that in a political sense. I mean that in a personality sense. Um, after all, if you think about, um, in in many ways, we are as far as you can get from entrepreneurs. We we have entered into a profession that has almost guaranteed life tenure. Um, you're, you're, you're never going to be a millionaire, but your, your kids are going to be fed, um, where there's um, the, the risk reward calculus for a federal judge is, is very different from uh, just about any other um, career path. And so I think there's, um, it, it attracts a type of person who is, is, as I say, conservative by nature. Um, and, and why that's important is um, I, I think there are very few judges, uh, Judge Reinhardt might be an, an, ex, uh, an exception, who um, look to make, you know, um, uh, plow new ground or, or look, look to do something new and um, untested. We, uh, I think, uh, by nature are looking to be able to follow precedent whenever possible and uh, make sure that we are uh, not out on some dalliance or um, uh, frolic uh, from the, the legal tradition. Um, and so that's, that, that makes the, the circuit so important because as Judge Griffith said, um, there, there's actually very uh, relatively little case law from the Supreme Court on, on many, if not most of the issues that, um, uh, 
land before uh, the lower courts. And so, uh, of course, we would um, uh, want to and look to follow Supreme Court precedent if it's there. But since often uh, the Supreme Court will not have addressed the specific issue that we face, um, we turn naturally to, to uh, circuit precedent. Um, trial courts, uh, and, and as our circuit judges, are bound by, by their own circuit precedent. And so I'm always thrilled when I can find a, a circuit, a DC circuit um, opinion that is on point and, and uh, directs me to the appropriate uh, resolution of a case. Um, but even that is um, not, not always uh, available. And, and in part, uh, certainly the DC circuit is smaller than um, some of the other circuits, but um, you know, uh, some of the issues that we face in trial courts just don't come up all that often, um, and, uh, and uh, which is another reason that we, we look broadly then to, to other um, courts of appeals when, um, and, and even though those um, uh, precedents are not binding on us, um, they are very helpful and um, will be uh, ones that I would, I would typically look to, to follow. Um, one, one of the things that occurred to me about a, even, even another uh, a decision from another uh, circuit, um, that collegial process that Judge Griffith talked about, this idea that three minds are better than one, that there's been, um, th that opinion will have been the result of uh, uh, prior litigation in, in the lower court, um, uh, further briefing and what have you. Um, I think that that all uh, doesn't always ensure correctness uh, and and complete accuracy, but but does um, uh, lend uh, a certain credence and credibility to the the outcome and the decision making. That um, frankly, uh, and 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 simply the time that that frankly we don't always have in in the trial courts. Um, in my experience, I think trial courts can be tremendously. Uh, impactful, perhaps a uh, district judge would be the, the most impactful judge in a particular case. Um, but when you look at the arc of the law, uh, I, I, the, the, the circuit courts are, are um, primarily responsible for um, construing and, um, and, and uh, developing the law, of course, with the, within the parameters set by the, the Supreme Court. Um, I wanted to add one um, illustration of the importance of a circuit court opinion versus a district court opinion um, from a, a case that came in front of me uh, about four years ago. Um, this was a challenge um, to what the Department of Agriculture was doing under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, this case uh, was essentially a, a do-over of a case that had uh, uh, arisen in front of one of my uh, very distinguished colleagues four or five years before. I was thrilled to find he had uh, addressed almost every issue that was in front of me, and even better, um, the, the parties there had appealed him, and um, he had been affirmed. Um, the, the, the only trick was he, there were two issues in front of the district judge. And only one of those issues went up to the, the DC circuit and, and the, the circuit affirmed um, him on that issue. Um, so anyway, when those two issues came up in front of me, I felt very confident that I could just um, follow his thoughtful analysis and, and of course the binding precedent of the DC circuit on the, the first issue um, and, and be pretty confident that uh, all would go well. Um, but uh, to great, much to my surprise, um, the, this time the second issue went up to the circuit that had not been addressed before. And I was unanimously overruled. I, I, I must say, I checked Judge Griffith, you were not on this panel. So um, I, I'm not, <laughs> uh, not casting any aspersions there. But the, 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 the circuit didn't even mention my colleague's uh, prior opinion, which uh, I had um, uh, relied on at length. And so this was a bit of an epiphany for me as a, as a, a relatively new district judge about the importance of binding precedent 
versus uh, persuasive precedent, uh, and especially persuasive precedent from the trial courts that um, the circuits uh, may or may not find all that persuasive and, and, and are, are free to, to disregard as they like. Uh, and, and, and I think there, there probably is, as I say, given that the different process that comes in um, the, the result of a, a circuit court opinion versus a district court opinion, um, I, I think um, it's, it's not surprising that um, a circuit court would pay a lot more attention, um, uh, of course, not only to their own binding precedent in their own circuit, but even to um, uh, decisions from uh, sister circuits, which um, while they're free to ignore, um, they may well create the type of uh, circuit splits that Professor Hawley mentioned. Um, that of course isn't an issue um, when you're looking at decisions from the trial courts. And, and I think just goes to, to one of the, the differences uh, between the, the two courts and um, the, the importance of, of the role um, the circuits play in, in the, uh, the, the creation of our, our case law. Thank you all so much for those insightful opening remarks. I'll remind our audience to submit their questions by the Q&A feature. Uh, but now I wanna open it up for discussion among the panelists. Judge Griffith, do you want to respond to or elaborate on anything Professor Hawley or Judge McFadden said? And then um, you all can take it away. Yeah, first of all, I, I, I want to chide Professor Hawley for uh, saying that she's not experienced in this. Uh, just so our audience knows, if they haven't looked up her biography already, she, she clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson, who many of us think is one of the greatest judges in the history of the Republic, not just living. Uh, and then, she, of course, she uh, clerked for the Chief Justice of the United States. So I think she has some great insights that uh, that actually that her perspective may uh, be better than than those of us who are deeply enmeshed in it. So, and, and so I'd like to raise one issue um, uh, that either can can respond to, but I, I briefly alluded to this in my my opening remarks. Um, uh, there's a, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the the uh, confirmation process today. Um, the thought, uh, e even for court of appeals judges, the thought is that it's become uh, too partisan. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the judge for whom uh, Professor Hawley uh, first clerked, uh, Judge Wilkinson, is being a strong critic of the current uh, method of confirmation, which is uh, done a, which in, in which the uh, filibuster is not permitted. Um, I, I'm a product of the filibuster. I, I was not President Bush's first choice for the DC Circuit nor his second, nor his third. <laughs> I, I'm what you get when you really want Miguel Estrada, but the Democrats uh, filibustered him and so, 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 so you get me. Um, uh, so therefore I'm, I'm actually in favor of the, uh, of, of the filibuster. I, I think it has a tendency um, to remove um, some partisanship from, from the process. Uh, uh, Judge Wilkinson shares uh, that view. The question I have though, or uh, careful observers uh, like Professor Hawley and Professor McFadden is whether it has made a difference at all. I mean, Pro Professor Wilkinson, at the time that the filibuster was eliminated, predicted that uh, judicial nominations would become uh, the, sort of the, pro the special province of special interest groups who would who would uh, urge um, the, the, the selection of judges who would have uh, uh, partisan views or view ideological views that they favored. That was the warning. Um, is, is any observation about that? About whether that's maybe maybe Judge McFadden can't touch that one. Probably, probably shouldn't ask him. But Professor Hawley, do you have any views on that? Have we seen have, have we seen that prediction uh, uh, come to pass, or is it something we should worry about? So that's a really good question. I'm not sure of the data as to the filibuster process. I think it's certainly true that the filibuster was a way of ensuring that there was some cooperation across the aisle. Um, I think the confirmation heatedness has been something we've seen building for a while, even preceding uh, the filibuster, maybe particularly for the Supreme Court justices, um, but for, for Court of Appeals judges um, as well. We, we had visited about this in our 
in our call prior to this uh, webinar, but Justice Scalia, of course, was confirmed 98 to zero, um, which is something that would never uh, happen today. So we do see a real divide. I, I think one of the reasons uh, we're seeing the divide is that we in America and as litigants are relying on the Supreme Court to decide more and more things. Um, and when things like abortion and when these sorts of social, political, and economic issues are, are divided by the Supreme Court, um, oftentimes instead of the elected branches, then, then we do get these, these sort of um, intense debates and intense interest in who might serve on, on the courts of appeals um, or on the Supreme Court. So, so definitely the confirmation process has changed dramatically over time. Um, I'm not sure how much the filibuster process has, has contributed to that. Yeah. So if, if I can be allowed a personal uh, observation. So I was on the, the D.C. Circuit for 15 years. I was appointed by uh, President George W. Bush, and I consider myself uh, an originalist and a textualist, right? And 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 on top of that, on top of that, a judicial conservative, a, a minimalist, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of old school in that regard. Um, not all of my colleagues uh, had that background or those uh, those uh, inclinations, uh, those approaches, and yet, I, you know, in 15 years on the D.C. Circuit, I never once see. I, I mean this. I never once saw any of my colleagues, whether they were appointed by President Obama or President Trump or whoever, I never once saw them cast a vote that I thought was really an expression of their partisan preferences. I, um, th 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 there were differences to be sure, but they were differences over uh, how to read a text, um, um, uh, you know, how to construe a constitutional provision, the rule of deference. I mean, th these are legal issues. They're not, they're not, they're not partisan issues. Um, and so uh, so I guess I would have to say in response to um, uh, Judge Wilkinson's forecast that, you know, I haven't seen that. I, I haven't seen that yet. What I see is, um, I mean, we all remember you know, the Chief Justice's rebuke of President Obama when President Obama, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> President, President Trump, when President Trump dismissed a decision that he didn't like and he called him an Obama judge. Uh, remarkable. Uh, that the same day, I believe it was, uh, the Chief Justice issued a statement saying we don't have Obama judges and Bush judges and Trump judges. A lot of people you know, thought the Chief Justice was being naive. Um, I actually don't think so. Uh, so. So my point is, I, I haven't seen that yet. I, I see judges struggling with legal issues, not, uh, not, not jockeying to, uh, to advance partisan policies they they favor but maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm being fooled i don't know i think one example too that you see of that of course to, to go back to justice Scalia again is his um well-known friendship with justice ginsburg um very much different outcomes and and some of the heated cases of the day but they respected one another's legal judgment and integrity and so, so i think that's another good example of that it, it, can I add add to that? And, and I think uh, I think Justice Kavanaugh has said this publicly, so I don't think I'm out of school here. But uh, we all uh, sadly remember um, uh, his brutal uh, confirmation process. It was just unseemly in so many ways. Um, he was uh, confirmed on a Saturday afternoon and immediately took the oath of office, which was a good thing to do. And then later that day was in his chambers preparing for arguments that were going to be the next Tuesday. Within 24 hours of his confirmation, every single one of his new colleagues came by to pay a personal visit to him on a weekend in chambers. Yeah, so that I, I wish that's a story that more people knew. These people, and it's the same on the Court of Appeals, we disagree over things, uh, but there's a level of friendship and respect uh, that generally prevails. I mean, every once in a while, somebody will throw a sharp elbow and people will cry foul. But but these are people who have deep respect uh, for one another and respect for the process that got them there. Uh, I wish more. I, I wish more people in the media. I wish more pundits uh, saw that. I think if they did, there would be less um, complaining about our uh, judiciary. So it, it, I, I'm taking too much time. But in the wake of Dobbs, I was interviewed by a Washington Post on a Washington Post webinar about the Supreme Court. And the question inevitably came up of, uh, so why, you know, why is why is the judiciary in, in, held in such low regard by Americans today? 
And my response was, well, you all keep writing that it's partisan and you keep driving that home. I think the best response to this is the one that uh, the Justice Barrett gave. She said, for those of you who claim we're partisan hacks, read our opinions, read our opinions. Uh, now, the problem with that is they're long, right? But if people, if people do that, and this is about the Court of Appeals as well, what you'll see is not partisans jockeying for position. You'll see serious people wrestling with difficult legal, legal issues, uh, not political issues. Okay, I've, I've gone too long with my, uh, my sermon, but uh, thank you. I was going to add uh, just a brief vignette from um, my courthouse, your your old courthouse uh, judge, um, the, the judge's dining room, and and what a wonderful tradition we had for for many years, really up to to COVID, of um, a number of us gathering for lunch um, uh, over from generations, various generations, and presidential um, appointments, and and um, uh, then Judge Kavanaugh was. A, a regular attender there, and I, I know was um, was and is um, much loved by um, uh, judges in in our courthouse. But I, I think that there is um, a something. One of the neat things about uh, being in the, the the D.C. Circuit courts is that we're all together in that same building, and the opportunities both for the law clerks uh, and for the the judges to to see each other regularly and. and to, to have that have that interaction. Yeah, and I again, I, I was the direct beneficiary of that. That's how I got to know uh, your former colleague, uh, Justice Jackson, uh, because we were in the same courthouse and ran into each other and became friends. And, uh, and therefore she asked me to introduce her at her confirmation hearings, which I was happy to do. Uh, apparently some people thought it was newsworthy that uh, a, a political conservative who had been appointed by George W. Bush would recommend the confirmation of uh, a political progressive who was being nominated by uh, by Judge Biden, but Biden uh, by President Biden. But as as Aaron pointed out, in the old days there was nothing novel about that at all. Yeah, Scalia ninety eight to nothing, Ginsburg ninety six to three. Um, anyway, um, maybe uh, looping back to something uh, uh, Professor Hawley mentioned the the importance of. Um, judges um, solo concurrences or or dissents and and raising issues up it to the Supreme Court it was occurring to uh, occurring to me um, uh, in light of Bruin and the the Supreme Court's um, really call on um, uh, federal courts to um, uh, re-examine uh, Second Amendment challenges with a, a real um, originalist, I think, focus on, on the history and tradition of, of what sort of what gun laws would have looked like um, at the, at the uh, time of the, the Second Amendment. And I think that's, that is a process that we're all in. It's um, uh, in some ways a, uh, a potentially a challenging one um, to uh, make sure that you um, have your arms around the historical uh, uh, record and and understand how those would have fit into um, the the jurisprudence uh, of the time. But I, I think that's that's a great example of where, um, uh, especially the the circuits. Although I think that the dis district courts may well have to do a lot in in terms of uh, record building um, potentially. But uh, I, I think it it's that that's an important and a, and a, a difficult undertaking and, and probably one that um, uh, with the with the rise of originalism, we're going to be needing to do in, in more and more areas, thinking uh, rigorously, not just what what would I like the Constitution to say, but what what um, what does it say? What did it uh, mean to those who uh, ratified it and um, understanding that historical context is is something that's going to uh, land uh, heavily, I think, on the on the circuit courts. That, 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 and that's a great example because if you read, if you, if let's go back to Heller, uh, uh, Justice Scalia's uh, masterful opinion in Heller was based in large measure on Judge Silberman's uh, 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 opinion. In the case was then called Parker uh, uh, in the D.C. Circuit, and I, I had the pleasure to be on that panel and. Uh, 
uh, in many ways, uh, Judge Silberman viewed that as a sort of the capstone of his magnificent uh, a career, and uh, and 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 Justice Scalia relied heavily on that as an example of what Aaron's talking about—the percolating. Same thing with Bruin. If you read Bruin, uh, Justice Thomas relies uh, heavily on, uh, surprisingly, some uh, Second Amendment cases in the D.C. Circuit of all uh, places. And uh, I, I I mentioned that with some sense of pride and ego because he relied on some of my work. So, uh, but so that's an example. That I, I can also give you examples where they have not relied on my work. <laughs> but uh, um, but that's an example of uh, what Professor Holland was talking about. I think Bruin's such a good example too, because the cases that they cited for in looking for history and tradition were First Amendment cases. So that raises the question of, you know, how far is the court willing to re-examine its prior precedent based on originalism and historical research? And, and maybe it's beyond the Second Amendment, um, in which case um, the, the uh, federal courts uh, will be very busy digging into all of that. So Aaron, I, we we didn't we didn't plan for me to ask you this question, and so it, if if it's a bad one, don't answer it. But um, from your perspective as a former Supreme Court clerk, um, um, how much attention do the justices pay to uh, decisions by a court of appeals, particularly when they are penned by? Uh, judges who they they know and have confidence in. You gave some. I can't remember if it was you or Judge McFadden gave the examples of the concurrences. Uh, you did in, in the Dobbs case. How 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 common is that? How important is that? I think it's very important. Um, these different concurrences for two reasons. Uh, the first is, as you mentioned, given the Supreme Court's discretionary jurisdiction. Um, these uh, concurrences or dissents from in-bank review or those sorts of things are really important in highlighting that there are actual conflicts of the law that need to be resolved um, or, or just disagreement. Um, I think there were a number of um, concurrences or even, I think it was the concurrences, just pointing out that, that lower court judges didn't know what to do um, mm -hmm. under under uh, June Medical and some of the court's abortion cases. And, and so that highlighted that the court needed to take the case um, and then you've got the substantive reasoning as well. Um, and I think particularly judges that, um, you know, the Supreme Court justices have worked with before, that respect their work, those sorts yeah. of things, uh, absolutely, they, ma they matter tremendously. So I, th I think as a litigant, then, therefore, that becomes really important, right? If you're in front of the Court of Appeals and you have a tough issue, uh, maybe the best that you can hope for um, is to get a, a judge who has some relationship, I don't know the way to phrase that with the Supreme Court, is respected by the Supreme Court or uh, to write separately, uh, to write separately for you. So I think it's interesting that some of these that you refer to were concurrences, right? Mm -hmm. um, not always dissents, uh, mm -hmm. um, but you know, when, when Judge Eck, look, let's be candid, when Judge Wilkinson writes separately about something, everyone pays attention. Um, and I think that's true for for a number of other uh, judges as well on the Court of Appeals. So so they serve that sort of uh, uh, it's the percolating functions like they've identified an issue that the justices will pay will pay attention to. Hopefully. It's a, it's an interesting point about the en banc process, and this is my my guess is perhaps true, especially in a couple of the a few of the circuits where. A litigant may not really have any hope of getting the en banc court to take, let alone reverse the, the a, a panel opinion. But that this, I think they're called dissentals now. Is that the yeah. the, the 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 term we use um, for a, a dissent from rehearing en banc that can have a a separate um, uh, role as a as a signaling device to to the the justices. Um, it. It also occurs to me, uh, while uh, A, I did not clerk in the Supreme Court, and, and B, I, I'm quite confident that the, the justices themselves are making the, the final call. I, I, the, the cert pool at the Supreme Court is pretty well known and is staffed by Supreme Court clerks who almost all are uh, former clerks at uh, courts of appeals and, and therefore um, have firsthand knowledge of um, the, the circuit judges and, and um, both for whom they clerked and others they, they um, 
uh, ju judges, particularly in their circuits. And so I think those, those I imagine those law clerks can pay, play a very important role in, in uh, flagging cases from, from uh, circuit judges for their, their, their justices. Thank you all. Let's turn to some audience questions now. Um, we have one here from Great Federal Society friend Jeff Wood. Um, I'll just go ahead and read the question and, and you all can respond as um, you'd like. Um, he asks, are there any special avenues of review for federal district court equitable or quasi equitable orders, such as injunctions, mandamus, et cetera, that pur purport to have national effect? This seems to be a particularly fraught area for how the judiciary fits into overall federalism. I'd also be interested in the panelists' thoughts about such orders in general. Um, well, uh, my greetings to, to Jeff Wood. He's um, a wonderful lawyer and a, a good friend of mine. Um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to the other two to talk about the propriety of, of these. Um, but um, uh, when, when there is a... The, these equitable, um, this equitable relief, it typically would come up in the posture of a preliminary injunction and perhaps a, an emergency preliminary injun injunction that was uh, presented to the a district judge who uh, and a district judge granted. Um, and while those are not unusual, I, I get um, I uh, probably half a dozen to a dozen each year uh, motions for a preliminary injunction. Um, they typically just uh, bind the, the, the parties to the case um, and, and it would be therefore relevant to a, a, a one or more plaintiffs and, and the, the defendant. Um, I think uh, Jeff is, is referring though to the rise of nationwide injunctions, which in fact have um, um, you might say skyrocketed over the last few decades. This is actually a creation, I believe, of the DC circuit from the 1970s. Judge Griffith may know better than me, but- Yeah, yeah and um, we refer to the 1970s as the bad old days. On, <laughs> on so I was born in the 1970s. I no, believe I mean, Professor Hawley did too. So. No, no, I mean, I mean for the <laughs> jurisprudence of the DC circuit, not for life in general. Uh, um, so uh, we, the nationwide injunctions really did not, um, you had one or two in the 1970s. You saw a few then in the 1990s. Um, I believe there were um, maybe eight or so in the eight years of the George, uh, George W. Bush's uh, tenure. Um, uh, somewhere uh, in the teens, in the eight years of um, uh, President Obama's tenure of eight years. And then I, I, I've heard the number was 55 in the first three years of, of President Trump. And, and I know uh, there have been a number now um, under um, uh, President uh, Biden. So there certainly has been a significant rise in them. Uh, as I say, those get teed up. Um, um, and, and unlike the typical one, which is just between a couple plaintiffs or the plaintiff and the the defendant, those would, uh, as I say, apply nationwide against all the government against everybody else. Um, and, and there is an emergency uh, review. You can, uh, a, a preliminary injunction is considered a, a, a final appealable order. And so it can get teed up to the uh, Court of Appeals. Um, and and if the if, if Judge Griffith could talk about this more, but um, I think that the, the Court of Appeals can certainly um, review those those quite rapidly. Um, so it, it, it I, I know um, there's been a lot of attention paid to those, and in part just because they've been a lot more um, numerous in recent years than historically. Um, and it, 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 it is a, it, an interesting aberration from the, the typical way um, these, these uh, typical ways matters percolate in the federal courts. I think the question also is interesting and it raises the fact that these are typically equitable remedies. Um, Professor Sam Bray has done some excellent work on looking at what that meant historically and whether perhaps it applied just to the parties pending before the lawsuit or, or rather more broadly. I think Justices Thomas and Gorsuch have raised sort of similar issues uh, with nationwide injunctions. 
Yeah, and, and as an old school judicial conservative who thinks that the primary role is to of our project is to limit the role of the judiciary, uh, I, it's a development that I think is is uh, not healthy for for the republic. It, it's just it seems too much like politics being played out in the uh, uh, in the judiciary, and I don't and I don't like that. Um, so, Judge, since uh, you're no longer sitting, I, I, I want to um, stand up, up now, with so. you on that. Um, you're yeah. probably aware within the last week or so, there was this interesting back and forth in the Supreme Court over um, uh, vacatures, um, which end up having a very similar effect, even though they're, they're of, of one party getting the, a, a, a federal uh, executive order vacated for everyone. Yeah. Um, even though those everybody else was not in in front of of that court, um, and I, I, I believe uh, your former colleagues who are now on the from the D.C. Circuit who are now on the Supreme Court um, kind of took issue with the the suggestion that there was anything wrong with that uh, versus an equitable um, uh, equitable relief. Um, these vacature uh, orders come uh, arise under the APA. Uh, wondered if you had any thoughts. Yeah, about so that. unfortunately, I'm on record on that, so I can't change my views. Uh, I was persuaded by uh, Judge Randolph when I was on the D.C. Circuit that uh, uh, if something's unlawful, it's unlawful and it should be vacated instead of remanded to fix. So um, I, I'm not. I, my, my views are in flux. I'm, I'm teachable, um, uh, but I was uh, I was in that school of thought on the D.C. Circuit, which I, you saw emerge in the. Uh, uh, the Oregon. What 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 was the phrase uh, the Chief Justice used about uh, vacating five, five times, times before lunch? Before, bre I believe. before breakfast. Or, or was it breakfast? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it was. So um, I think I was heavily influenced by that school of thought. But uh, um, um. we have another question that goes to the conversation around um, appointments. Um, our viewer says. The judiciary in general is quite distinguished, but the confirmation process is so contentious that one wonders to what extent ju good judicial candidates have been discouraged from getting involved or being recruited. Please comment. Um, so, I wonder if you have any reactions to that. Uh, you know, I don't know of anyone uh, who being approached about, and I can just speak from the Court of Appeals experience, uh, being approached about. Um, uh, being appointed to a court of appeals who has said no because of because of that, um, but perhaps they exist. Um, uh, but you know, I will you know, don't feel sorry for federal appeals court judges. It's a great appointment. It's a great life. It's the like the best job, second best job in the world. Uh, but you know, it really is um, awful. <laughs> um the, the 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 way the process has has devolved um and so so maybe maybe there are folks who have said thanks but but no thanks but i'm not aware of anyone um everyone i know when approached about it counts the cost and says okay here we go but um uh, it, it's such a wonderful opportunity to serve that uh, that they go through it but 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 maybe professor holly and judge mcfadden have a different perspective or a great experience with that. But you know that that seems to be probably to be be generally true. I do think if you think about Justice Kavanaugh um, or Justice Barrett, um, you know, was accused of all sorts of things yeah. for having adopted children of all things, um, or, or being a working mom, like th those sorts of things that you would think would just be off limits, uh, and yet um, were not in the current political climate. So so absolutely amazing opportunity um, and, and things. Um, I think people approach the process knowing um, that it might be brutal, but but that it's worth it ultimately to be able to serve. Judge Griffith, did you have any any further thoughts on um, on possibilities, maybe short of restoring the filibuster for um, reducing the partisanship of? Yeah, of yeah. So I, I I do, and it, it arises out of uh, my experience uh, testifying on behalf of uh, of uh, Justice then Judge Jackson, now Justice Jackson. Um, I, I got uh, uh, some really, in, lots of uh, re private responses from folks who are involved in, 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 in the process, both on the executive side and the, uh, uh, the congressional side. 
um, uh, saying, gee, yeah, wouldn't it be great if, um, and it's born of the idea, I have the idea that presidents ought to get their people as judges, you know, uh, uh, elections have consequences. And if you elect a conservative president, he or she's more likely going to pick somebody who has a originalist textualist view. And that's, that's fine. And vice versa, right? I mean, vice versa. So um, I, I come to the view that presidents ought to be able to get, you know, highly qualified, competent uh, people uh, out to their own uh, liking. And so, so I, there was lots of interest uh, expressed privately from both sides of the aisle. Um, stay tuned. I don't, I, I doubt change will happen, but there are a number of us old timers who are on both sides of the aisle who are committed to trying to see if something can be, something can be done. Because I think everyone agrees the status quo just isn't, uh, isn't, isn't satisfactory. Um, Professor Hawley mentioned, you know, Justice Scalia being confirmed 98 to nothing. And then his protege, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, doesn't draw a single vote from the other side of the aisle. Something's, something's, something's changed, definitely. Then the question is, is it a change for the better or for the worse? I think it's a change for the worse. And I'm hopeful um, that some change can happen. Uh, we're we're going to try. I'm not, I'm hopeful, but hope springs eternal. And what? faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what comes of it. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for sharing their valuable time and expertise with us today. And thank you to our audience for joining and participating. We welcome audience feedback by email at info at fedsoc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.